So we're looking today at Isaiah chapter 54. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always kind of a um, challenge to know exactly what to entitle chapters and teachings. Um, I just called this Everlasting Covenant because it seems to me that that's the central theme in Isaiah 54, but it very much is a continuation of what we saw in chapter 53, uh, which itself is a continuation of what we saw in 52. Uh, and that all has to do, of course, with the, the servant Messiah, the servant king uh, who's promised to come. And uh, therefore, in chapter 54, what we're seeing are, are the, uh, the blessings that the servant king is bringing, uh, specifically to the nation of Israel, although, of course, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And we have been grafted into the vine of Israel. We who believe in Jesus as Messiah, we who seek to follow him as Lord. Uh, we've been grafted into the uh, vine of, of uh, Israel. And therefore, these promises, uh, even though they were originally made to a group of Jewish people many hundreds of years ago, also apply to us collectively and individually, um, which brings up an interesting point, and that is that um, so many of these passages are um, uh, American preachers and American Christians in, in, in general have a tendency to look at these passages and to apply them individualistically when in fact uh, they are uh, broader than that. They're spoken to the entire community um, of faith, um, not, not just the broad community, but the community of faith. Um, and and uh, it, it's not that it's, it's wrong to think that God's talking directly to me, but the, the picture here is much bigger than that. The other thing to notice as we get into it is that, and this applies not just to this chapter, but actually through most of Isaiah, this is poetry. Uh, and as poetry, Isaiah uses one figure of speech after another. He uses a lot of similes. He uses a lot of metaphors. A lot of times he mixes metaphors. You'll find Jesus does the same thing. And you were probably taught in English class never to mix a metaphor. Um, but um, Jesus didn't take your English class. And so um, he, he does. And Isaiah does. And it's therefore probably okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, but my point is that th this is poetry, uh, so we, we expect figures of speech. Uh, we don't go into it reading it uh, literally. You know, for example, when God says uh, elsewhere in the prophet that, uh, speaking to the nation of Israel, he says, I, as I passed by and saw you polluted in your own blood, he's talking to the nation of Israel. He's talking to uh, the nation of Israel as if she were a young woman uh, who was um, menstruating. And, and he says, uh, you know, he talks about cleansing her and, and purifying her. Um, and yet, you know, I've seen people apply that to uh, things like leukemia. And um, not that God can't he heal leukemia, but that's not what that passage is talking about. Um, so, uh, we begin here in chapter 54, verse 1. Shout for joy, O barren one who has borne no children. Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. He's talking to the nation of Israel. And he, he's using a metaphor to describe the nation of Israel as a woman who has been unable to bear children. Uh, for the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of the one who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the sight of your tent. Let your curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and the left, and your descendants will possess nations, and they will settle desolate towns. He's talking in context to the nation of Israel, which has been in bondage, uh, to Babylon, and then, of course, Persia conquered Babylon. Um, so the, the nation has, has been in bondage uh, for the last 50, 60, 70 years. And he's describing them. He's, it's like the whole nation 
feels like uh, it's just wasting away. Like, like um, you know, we're th- this this whole Jewish thing is just going to die out. And he's saying to the nation of Israel, no, that's not the case. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back. Um, your families are going to grow. Their families are going to grow. The, the point is the nation of Israel itself is going to get bigger. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, I, I bring that up because I've heard individuals, I, I've, I've heard, I've been in prayer meetings where women who wanted to have children and uh, so far had not been able to have children uh, have, have um, you know, um, claimed verse one and following, um, you know, God, God has absolutely promised me that I'm going to have lots of children, you know, um, and no, God hasn't absolutely promised you that. Um, God may give you children and children are a blessing and that's wonderful. But if you don't have children, that's okay too, because God still loves you and you're whole and you're complete. And um, yeah, so, uh, and, and verses two and three, I've heard preachers um, quote unquote, claim that in prayer publicly from the pulpit as if it meant that their church was going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's not what that means at all. It's talking about uh, the Jewish people who at the time felt this uh, sense of attrition. It's like we're, we're fading away. We're not going to be any of us left. This whole line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, is going to die out, you know, in a couple of generations. God is assuring them that that is not going to happen. He's assuring them that Israel is going to flourish. Uh, in that culture, of course, divine blessing is was often thought of in terms of large, healthy families. This is an agrarian society, a farming community, small family farms. Um, and, and so, you know, having a large family to help out on the farm was a blessing. Having healthy families that can do the hard work of farming is a blessing. Uh, an abundance of crops, uh, you know, healthy flocks and herds of sheep and goats and so forth. Um, that's the way uh, blessing was, was viewed. Uh, so poetically, Isaiah is speaking of the nation as being a nation that's, that's going to grow, that's going to be healthy, that's going to have life, that's going to flourish. Now, does God want you to grow spiritually, to have life and health and to flourish? Yes, God does want you to. But it's not all about us as individuals. It's about the community of faith being a uh, spiritually healthy community. Flourishing means to be, in the New Testament sense, means to be filled with, to be overflowing with love, cruciform love, the love of Jesus. It has nothing to do with, you know, having a huge congregation and a massive campus and, um, you know, enormous salaries for pastoral staff and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know mega church pastors that, that make uh, $600,000 a year, you know, which I think is absolutely, um, I, I think it's absurd and I, and I, and I think it's, it's, pretty close to immoral i think maybe it is immoral but anyway uh and they base they base they justify it by reading scriptures like this and that's not what this is about do not fear for you will not be ashamed do not be discouraged for you will not suffer disgrace for you will forget the shame of your youth um what's he referring to there i don't i, I don't know for sure he's talking about Israel's youth, the nation's youth. So perhaps it's a reference to the time when the nation was enslaved in Egypt. Um, I, you will forget the shame of your youth and the disgrace of your widowhood, uh, which seems to me might be a reference to the captivity in Babylon, which, which uh, I think to the nation as a whole felt like God has divorced us. God's, God's gone. God's off the scene. We're we're uh, no longer married to Yahweh, you know, where God has left us in this situation. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. So again, speaking to the nation, speaking to the community, God says your guilt is forgiven. 
Now that applies to the community of faith today. And that applies to all the members of the community of faith today. It applies to you and me. Uh, guilt is uh, there because you, you recognize that you did something wrong. Um, guilt is actually a good thing because it, it, it lets us know that we did something wrong, that we offended somebody or that we hurt somebody. And, and so we can apologize and so we can be reconciled. And, um, and we know that God is right there ready to forgive us of whatever it is that caused our guilt. Shame is something which we, uh, others impose on us or we impose on ourselves. Guilt says, I did something that's wrong. Shame says, I am wrong. That I, I, there, there's something fundamentally wrong with me as a person. And that's not of God, whether it's, in a, whether it's a community that feels that way or whether it's individuals that feel that way. Um, there, there's nothing essentially wrong with you. You're created in the image and likeness of God. Your core identity is beloved of God. God loves you so much he sent his son. Yes, you, you have made mistakes, certainly. You know, sin is forgiven. Transgressions are removed as far as the east is from the west. Sin is cast into the deepest sea. Uh, but God doesn't want you uh, carrying around a sense of shame that says that I'm, I'm a terrible person. I'm worthless. Um, I'm no good, you know, those kind of things, which, which oftentimes are messages that come from people who were in our lives, um, um, often when we were small children. Uh, so God says to the nation, and he's also saying it to us, lift up your eyes and shake off your discouragement. Um, know that Martin Luther King Jr. was correct when he said that the, the long arc of history bends towards justice. It doesn't seem like that sometimes. A lot of times it looks like things are going backwards. It looks like things are getting worse. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's a new Jim Crow, which is popping up and, you know, it's, it's all around us. And uh, it, it's easy to, to lose heart when you see that. Um, but but um, Dr. King was right when he said that ultimately that long arc of history is bending towards justice because God's bending it that way and justice uh, will prevail. Um, that phrase, your, your maker is your husband that we read just a moment ago. Um, I've heard that vastly misquoted and misapplied also. Uh, Yahweh is speaking to Israel Yahweh is saying, I'm, I'm the husband, the nation is his bride, his wife. And of course, in a patriarchal society, uh, the husband is the, the married male who's responsible for the stewardship of the household. And, and it brings with it connotations of providing for the household and protecting the household. And there's an underlying assumption of godliness and wisdom. In, in other words, what God is saying to the nation of Israel is, I'm here to care for you. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to uh, provide for you. I'm, uh, you. You can trust me. You can count on me. I, I will always be faithful to you. He's saying that to the nation of Israel. He's saying that to the church, which has been grafted into the nation of Israel. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a wife of a man's youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath for a moment I hid my face fr from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Uh, again, he's using a, a, a metaphor, a figure of speech. He's, he's saying, uh, think, think of me like um, uh, a, a husband who, who comes to rescue his wife. Uh, think of me as someone who finds the, the forsaken woman and brings her into the family of love. Think of me, um, you know, when you, when you think about the captivity that's in Babylon, you know, the last 50 so years. Um, and it, that was that's kind of like 
a person having an angry outburst that that you know they're they're angry for a moment but then it goes away focus on the fact that with everlasting love i will have compassion on you says the lord your redeemer so you see he's using these domestic similes and these domestic metaphors so uh he's inviting us to imagine a, a grieving abandoned spouse who is welcomed into a loving family I think we see a couple of beautiful examples of that in the New Testament. For example, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, who pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of Jesus' garment and was instantly healed. Jesus called her out. And and I'm, and when, at the moment that he did that, I'm sure that was embarrassing for her. She felt like she'd done something wrong. And, and according to the law of Moses, she had. She was ceremonially unclean. And she had touched a whole bunch of people. She wasn't supposed to touch anybody. Uh, getting through the crowd to get to Jesus. And worst of all, she's touched the rabbi, you know, himself. But Jesus calls her out not to embarrass her, but to cup her face in his hands and call her daughter. He wanted to do more than just heal her physically. That's great. But he wanted to take her beyond that. and welcome her into the family of god this this is a this is a woman who because of her condition has been ostracized uh if she had been married she was divorced because of it um nobody wants her around nobody will she's homeless she's reduced to begging um she, she's she's an outcast um nobody everyone has rejected her she can't she can't go into the synagogue she can't worship she can't go into the temple uh and jesus adopts her he calls her daughter he makes her part of the family of god and you know and uh, another example is the samaritan woman at the well uh samaritans and jews you know not getting along rabbis aren't supposed to talk to women in public especially alone um and and Jesus, as you follow that conversation, um, Jesus not only reaches out to her, he, he, he restores her. He brings her into the family. He brings her into the fold. He brings her into the embrace of God's love, and it radically transforms her life. Um, he says that he, I will have everlasting compassion upon you. God's love is everlasting. Nothing can stop it. God's covenant, his agreement is everlasting. Nothing can break it. Now, why is that? Well, because the new covenant is not an agreement between God and us. It's an agreement between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And therefore, that perfect love flowing throughout the Trinity heart, uh, the triune heart of God, uh, makes it divine. It makes it unbreakable. It can't fail because no part of the Trinity can fail because every part of the Trinity is God. Uh, verse 9, the, this is like the days of Noah to me, just as I swore that the waters of Noah would never again go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love will not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. It's a beautiful series of promises, isn't it? God says that his steadfast love and his covenant of peace are eternal. They will never depart from his children. His steadfast love, it's steadfast. <laughs> it's always there. It's always strong. It's always flowing. His covenant is a covenant of peace. It will never depart from us. Not only that, but God has deep compassion for us. Beyond that, he has empathy for us. He feels what we're feeling. He enters into our hurts. He's a man of sorrows, and he's acquainted with grief. And he promises the nation of Israel, I'll never be angry with you again. But hold on just a moment, because 
if we fast forward a couple hundred years, we see that in 70 AD, the Romans completely destroyed the nation of Israel. So I wonder, is there a contradiction there? What, what is going on? Um, something that we can think about on a deeper level. Oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, I'm about to set your stones and antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of jewels, and all your wall of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your children. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that's not to be taken in the strictest literal sense because um you know the, the when the jews returned uh to the land of israel and rebuilt their temple um they didn't make the foundations out of sapphires um the pinnacles were not made of rubies you know and again this is poetic language that is speaking of of the beauty of god's creation the beauty of of uh, Jerusalem, the beauty of the rebuilt temple, uh, but beyond that, the beauty of God dwelling with his people, God in the midst of his people, God in the midst of people whose children are being taught by the Lord. Great will be the prosperity of your children. He's not talking about making everybody rich. He's talking about uh, a, a thriving spiritual community that is uh, overflowing with love and with joy and with peace and with long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self control, a community in which uh, everyone is seeking to be the servant of everyone else, um, where reconciliation and forgiveness are the, the, the rule of the day, you know. Um, a, a community flourishing in harmony and in love is a beautiful community, whether that community is, um, you know, three people or whether it's 30 people. Um, antimony, uh, I, I put a picture there of antimony, sapphire and rubies. They're, they're, they're all uh, uh, naturally occurring um, gems. Um, beautiful gems. Uh, antimony is a is an essential element. Has kind of a metallic look to it, but it's it's not one of the metals. Um, but again, the the point is that um, uh, this description of the beautiful walls, you know, with all these jewels, and it, it it's it reminds us of the description of New Jerusalem in the Book of Revelation. Uh, it there it talks about you know foundations of precious gemstones and uh, gates made of pearls. And by the way, those gates are never shut. They're always open. And, and the, the invitation is always going out from them saying to everyone, everywhere, come if you're thirsty, come and drink, come to the water of life. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. The gates are open. They're never shut day or night. Come. That's, that's the beauty of the community of God, uh, welcoming, embracing, loving, never judging, um, never trying to coerce or control, but always trying to uh, uplift and help uh, those in need. And all the children, you know, being taught by God, isn't that a beautiful picture of children being taught by God? And of course, God uses scripture to teach us. He uses teachers to teach us. He teaches us by the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. There are lots of ways that God uses to teach. In righteousness, you shall be established, verse 14 says, you shall be far from oppression. Indeed, you shall not fear and from terror. Indeed, it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it's not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Um, you, what God's saying to the nation is, is you're, uh, I'm going to establish you in the faith. I'm going to make you a righteous people. Again, remember, we're grafted into the uh, nation of Israel. So make you a righteous people, which, which means a, a people who are right with God, 
people who are right in right relationship with other people, people who are in right relationship with themselves, they're not at war with themselves, people who are in right relationship with creation, caring for it. And, and the result of that is justice and harmony and peace and sustainability. The upshot of that is deliverance from oppression, um, no longer needing to be terrified or to have fear of, of uh, terrible things. Because where there is strife uh, in, in any relationship, uh, that's never coming from God. Um, that comes from us, not from God. See, it is I who created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon fit for its purpose. I have also created the ravenger to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, says the Lord. So what the Lord is saying is, I created the blacksmith who makes weapons. I also created the people who use weapons, you know, buy them and use them uh, to hurt other people. But I, I don't want the blacksmiths to create weapons. I would much rather, God is saying, I would much rather they uh, use their skills to produce uh, pruning hooks and, and uh, uh, plowshares, you know. And, and I don't want anyone to take a sword and to hurt other people. Um, that's, I don't cause that kind of thing. That's, that's, that's people who are uh, outside of my will who do those things. Uh, what he's saying is, trust in me. Don't, don't trust in, in, you know, your brand new sword that you got from the blacksmith. Don't trust in, uh, uh, you know, politicians or militias or you know, anything other than God. Um, because no weapon that's formed against us can prosper. What kind of weapons are formed against us? Well, they're spiritual weapons. And we fight them with spiritual weapons. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, Indeed, we live as humans, but do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. In Ephesians 6.10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against blood and flesh. Our struggle is not against humans. The problem is not, you know, that politician that you disagree with or that, um, gangbanger that's full of violence or you know uh the the problem is not other people um the the problem is satan uh, it's the principalities and the powers the demonic forces that are behind the evil things that people do and the evil things that nations do that's where the battle really is uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. He's talking about the realm of Satan and Satan's demons. And of course, Satan has, is, is holding many people in bondage. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, sometimes that's really obvious. You know, people that are addicted to drugs or alcohol, uh, people that are caught up in a gang lifestyle. I mean, it's, it's, it's really clear. We can look at that and recognize the bondage. But there's a lot of people who are just as much in bondage, but it's very subtle because they're in bondage to things that society approves of and even encourages, like money, power, success, 
or ideologies. You know, people can be in bondage to an ideology like fascism or communism or racism and so forth. Um, so many people around us are in bondage, but deep within, every human being yearns for true spiritual freedom. Uh, and true spiritual freedom comes only by connecting with God and connecting with God comes only through his son, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Remember that uh, Jesus said that he was building his church. Remember, he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Um, first of all, he's, he's, he's referring to the fact emphatically that he is going to do the building. I will build my church. Um, human beings build all kinds of stuff and God's not necessarily in it, but God is building his ecclesia, the church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, the community of faith, the community of people that are bonded together by the love, by divine love, divine cruciform love. Jesus is building that up. It has nothing to do with real estate. It has nothing to do with uh, political power. Uh, this is the kingdom of God that's rising up. And uh, Satan, you know, if it, 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 again, figure of speech, you know, picture this fortress, you know, uh, this, this big prison on a hillside. And Satan's got all these people locked up in this prison. Some of them are locked up in cells called drug addiction. You know, others are locked up in cells called uh, political power or whatever, you know. Uh, they, all these people are in bondage. Some of them know they're in bondage. Some of them don't. Some of them think they're really on top of things. But our responsibility, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He's not talking about uh, the, the church uh, hunkering down and hiding and, you know, being protected against these attacks from Satan. He's talking about the church attacking Satan's fortress. We attack, we pull down the walls, we, we, we break open the cells, we set the captives free. And, and how do we do that? Well, we do that with the weapons that God has given us. Our primary weapons are prayer and love. And, you know, Paul describes, put on the, the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation. Salvation is part of our, our, is a weapon that we use, as it were, you know, against those principalities and powers. Uh, the shield, uh, I mean, the breastplate of righteousness, right living, right relationship with God, self, others, nature, um, loins girt about with truth, uh, speaking and proclaiming the truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith with which to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Those are our weapons. Uh, our, and, you know, our, so primarily they boil down to being a person of prayer and being a person who loves unconditionally. There is power in that. Uh, if you will love others unconditionally, show them the love of Christ. And if you'll spend time in prayer, there is nothing too hard for God. It pulls down the, the, the walls. It sets the captives free. So, as we gather together for communion today, uh, I, I invite you to just uh, recognize, first of all, as we, you know, break the bread, which Jesus said was his body broken for us. And as we drink the cup, which Jesus said was uh, the cup of his uh, blood shed for us. Uh, as, as we partake of communion together, remember, uh, communion means we are one. We're part of the body of Christ. We're, he's speaking to us collectively. Our, our lives are intertwined, bound up with each other, um, which is why we rejoice with those that rejoice and we're sad with those that are sad and so forth. Um, it, communion also reminds us that we are one with God. We are united 
with the creator of the universe and therefore we're united with everything god created that hasn't been tainted you know by sin so i invite you to recognize that and to um enter into that fellowship with god and and take upon yourself the um voluntarily the the responsibility of prayer and love because with those weapons man we can set thousands and thousands of captives free um as we pray for people all around the world uh whether you know people that we know and people that we don't yet know you people you read about news you know so forth there's tremendous power in the prayer of a loving heart and so father i ask in jesus name that you would make these things very real to us embed them deep within our hearts and within our minds lord that uh we might recognize that you have given us an everlasting never ending covenant of peace you have brought us into right relationship with you you have enabled us to be in right relationship with others you have enabled us to be in right relationship with ourselves we can cast off all shame we can bring all sin iniquity and transgression to the foot of the cross and know that it is washed away forgiven and forgotten and gone forever off the table never to be brought up again we know that we are new creations in Christ Jesus and that old things have passed away and all things have become new We know Lord that you have breathed your holy spirit within us and it is Christ in us who is the hope of glory. And we know that you have given us new hearts, hearts that are capable of loving even the most unlovable of people. And so Father, help us to walk in that, to live into that, to demonstrate that in with everything that we do. And make us, we pray, people of prayer N- not just people who pray when there's uh, something going wrong or when we need something but make us people who are just so saturated with your spirit that our very lives become prayer for everyone with whom we have contact oh father bring us to the banqueting table right now we pray in the precious and holy name of jesus and so we come to the lord's table it's not the table of any particular church or denomination it's his table and everyone who wants to everyone who's willing is invited to come and we're reminded that jesus took the bread after the last supper and he broke it and blessed it and said this is my body broken for you this do in remembrance of me father bless this bread as we partake of it in jesus name amen after the same manner also jesus took the cup when he had finished the passover supper he lifted it up and blessed it and then he passed it around to his disciples and said drink from this all of you for this is the new covenant in my blood father bless this cup that we might enter deeply into your eternal unbreakable covenant amen thank you father for this time together thank you for revealing yourself more deeply to each of us than we have ever been able to see before continue to draw us into your heart we pray bless our time of discussion for those that are able to stay with us in Jesus name we pray amen